Uh, I'm actually going to continue our study uh, in the book of Philippians. Uh, we began our study a few weeks ago, uh, and it's, it's crazy. I, I was talking about this the other day to some of our, uh, our members, and I said, well, I never planned it to, uh, I never planned for this series to begin and start uh, right when uh, we stopped worshiping at the Courtyard Theater, or when we, we were told that we can't worship together at the theater. Um, we, we planned the series way, way in advance, way before that. Uh, but I feel in my heart that no matter how much you plan, God has his plan. Amen. Uh, and, and I feel like this was God ordained. Um, and, and, you know, we, we started talking about the book of Philippians and uh, we talked about the, the background of uh, Paul, the apostle, writing this particular book. Uh, this book of Philippians is, is also known as one of the prison epistles. Paul writes a bunch of books in the New Testament or epistles as it would come to be called and as we refer to it uh, in the church. Uh, these letters that he writes to different churches. Just to give you a backdrop of the book of Philippians, uh, Paul is locked up in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And upon learning that Paul is in prison, uh, the church in Philippi, who happens to be one of the churches that are very close to him in bond, in spiritual bond, in, in just uh, personal bond, uh, sends this, this person called Epaphroditus to Rome with financial aid and well wishes uh, to just let him know that they're thinking of him. And as a response, Epaphroditus re later returns to Philippi with this letter from Paul to the church in Philippi saying, hey, we want to th I want to thank you for thinking of me, for praying for me. Uh, no matter how many people have forgotten me, you guys are still praying for me. And this is kind of the backdrop. And this is that letter that he's, he's writing to that church in Philippi. And this particular, the, the theme of this particular book, uh, the book of Philippians, is joy. Uh, and, and Paul is trying to communicate joy through every chapter in this book. Uh, almost every verse that he pens in this book, he's communicating about how much joy he has in his life. And he's communicating to them about the importance of joy and how much joy they need to have being Christians. So we talked about what is joy over the last two weeks. We've been talking about that. We talked about how joy is an emotion that resides deep inside our soul, right? It's not this fleeting emotion. Uh, joy is very different from happiness. Happiness is a state of being, whereas joy is produced by the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and, and we see that in Galatians, uh, the love, joy, peace, and all of, those, all of those qualities. When we put our hope in Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, joy resides deep within our heart. Joy is not fleeting. It's, it's found in a person. It's not found in a circumstance. It's found deep within the Christian. Uh, in his knowledge of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done in his life. So we talked about how uh, Paul talks about joy as connected to the mind uh, 10 times in the book of Philippians. And he talks about joy uh, with, uh, with, and he connects that with, the, with our thinking five times in the book of Philippians. So there's 15 references to the Christian mind as we come to see it uh, in this book of Philippians uh, um, and, and how he ties in joy with our thinking patterns and how we think. So he wants to communicate to us that secret, the secret to joy is rooted in our attitudes and our thinking and the way you interpret your circumstances. Is often, uh, it often connects to the joy that is deep within you, right? So, so Paul is trying to convey to the people and saying, hey, you want to know why I have so much joy in the middle of my pain, in the middle of my imprisonment, in the middle of uncertainties? Do you know why I have so much joy? And he says, A, it's because, of, because I'm thankful, right? He talks about his thankfulness. He talks about his heart of gratitude. It's so important for us to understand as Christians that we, we are joyful when we are grateful, right? There's so much of uh, gratefulness that comes out of joy. Uh, second, last week, we talked about how his eyes were always on the prize, constantly on the prize, uh, in every verse that we talked about last week, leading up to verse number 18, Paul talks about, man, my mission is the gospel of Jesus Christ. My mission is Jesus Christ, my love of Jesus. And he keeps talking about that. And he says, you know why I have joy? Because my eyes are glued on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. My eyes are glued on him. And the third part we're calling heads I win, tails I win. Heads I win, 
tails I win. It's taken from the common adage, uh, heads you win, tails you lose. But in this aspect, in this particular message, what I wanna show you is just the reverse of how you win nonetheless. It's a win-win situation. Uh, when, when you have that attitude in your life, the uh, I'm always winning attitude, uh, you know, uh, there's so much of joy that comes out of that. And Paul is about to teach us what that means, right? So go with me to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 19. And this is what uh, Paul says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. What? His prison experience, uh, the chains that he's in, the struggles that he's going through, the uncertainty, the fear, the, all the, uh, you know, the, the tensions that are around him. He doesn't know if he's going to die or he's going to live. All of this, he says, revolves back to the fact that people are praying for him that people are interceding for him. He's encouraged. His heart is filled with joy because of that. Why? Because of their prayers. And then he says, because of the spirit of Jesus. He says, I have the spirit of Jesus within me. He says, Jesus had joy, even till the cross. And because of that, man, I know that everything will turn out for my deliverance. Now look at that word deliverance. He doesn't say deliverance in a good way, or he doesn't say deliverance in a bad way. He just said it's going to, be tur it's going to turn out to my deliverance. And in a few verses down, we'll understand what he's going to be talking about when he talks about that word deliverance, right? In verse number 20, he says this, as it is my eager expectation. So he's very eager right now, right? He's expecting, he's eagerly expecting, right? He says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, with full courage, he says, yeah, I'm eager, I'm anxious, but I'm courageous as well. Now, as always, more now than any other time is what he's saying, that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Whether by life, whether I'm going to live or I'm going to die, I'm going to make sure that Christ is going to be honored, right? What a beautiful passage. Like, what, what beautiful two verses we just read, right? He says, man, I'm eager and hopeful. Being hopeful in prison. How, how does that even happen? Why? How can I be hopeful in prison? Because he says, yeah, I'm eager. I'm anxious. And, you know, I'm, 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 I don't know. There's so much of uncertainty around me in this situation. And he says, I don't want to be ashamed. That's why I'm eager. But then behind his apprehension comes this, cur this courage out of nowhere. And he says, but still, no matter how anxious I am, I have so much of courage. Haven't you felt the peace of Jesus over this last few weeks? Man, even though we lived in uncertain times and even though we lived in times of anxiety and, and tensions and some of y'all work in the medical field and some of y'all work in hospitals and nursing homes and so on, in pharmacies and, and you know that it was you, you were anxious and you don't know what to expect. But in all that anxiety, didn't you see God give you peace beyond words and how courage stepped in and how you were courageous at times? That's what he's saying, man, I'm slightly anxious, but yet I'm fully courageous. That's crazy. And that's something that a Christian can have. You can be anxious and you can be courageous at the same time. And that's what he's trying to explain to us. And he says, either way, no matter what happens, he says, I will make sure that Christ is honored in everything I do. Would you make sure of that today? That no matter what you're going through, no matter how anxious you are, no matter how scared you are, no matter how fearful you are, that you will make sure that Christ is honored through everything that you do. And that's my question to you. Do you make sure that you do that? It's so important for you to do that. Are you honoring Jesus in your pain? Are you honoring Jesus in your pleasure? That's what Paul is saying. No matter if it's good or bad, man, I'm going to make sure that I honor Jesus. Are you honoring Jesus when you're a prince? Are you honoring Jesus when you're a pauper? Because we have this natural tendency that Jesus is only glorified when things are going the way that you want it to go because you want to share that testimony when it's good. But the testimony really doesn't come out when bad things are going on. I want you to make sure that you glorify him when even the odds are stacked up against you. Are you still glorifying Jesus? Right? Because in verse 21, he continues and says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
Man, this is where I'm coming to attitude number three. Here is where Paul shares his third attitude of joy. He says, you know why I'm joy in my prison experience? When I'm chained to this guy that's with me 24 hours a day. When I go to the toilet, this guy's chained to me. When, when I have to go and exercise, this guy's chained to me. There's no reprieve for me. And he says, but I'm still joyful. When I would be depressed as a human being, Paul's like, man, I'm joyful. And he says, this is why. And he says, I'll share it with you because it's a win-win situation. He says, in this game called life, right, he wins no matter which side the coin falls on. He says, man, I'm about to get into this game. I'm about to play this, this match. And the referee is about to toss this coin up. And if it lands on head, I might win the toss And if in, in normal circumstances. And if that coin lands on table, I, I'm probably, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to lose, right, in normal circumstances. But he says, in my circumstance, because I have joy, he says, if I live, I win. And if I die, I win. He says, man, tails I win, heads I win. It doesn't matter. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because his attitude is this. He says, man, life life on earth is temporary. It's this temporary mission trip for Jesus. That's his attitude. He's like, man, I don't know what y'all are stressing about, but for me, this is just my mission field, right? If, if, if I have to die, man, that's eternal bliss with Jesus. I win no matter what, because if I'm, if I'm living, I get to do what I love, which is preach about Jesus, live for Jesus. And if I die, I get to be with Jesus, right? Don't you see the joy in both? Right? For Paul, life or death would have been a tool for the kingdom of God, and that's what he cared about. Right? Imagine those people that are persecuting Paul. Imagine those Roman guards that are spitting on Paul and whipping Paul and, and lashing at like, like Think about that, right? Like If they look at Paul and say, Paul, I'm going to kill you, right? He's going to be like, thanks, right? Like, death is a gain, right? He's going to be like, thank you so much. I get to be with Jesus if you kill me. Go ahead and kill me. I'm happy. I'm joyful. And then they, they, they get frustrated and they're like, oh man, that didn't work, right? And he, they're like, okay, fine, we'll let you live. And he's like, thanks, like living is fruitful, right, for Jesus. I, I, thank you for letting me live because when I get out of here, I'm going to go share the gospel with more people and, and that's going to be amazing. And they're going to be like, oh man, there's no winning with this guy, right? Then they're going to be like, and then they're like, okay, we're not going to kill you. We're not going to make you live. We're not going to keep you alive. We're going to make you suffer, right? You're not going to just sit here by yourself. He's like, man, thanks. Are you going to make me suffer? Go ahead, bring it on, right? For I'm, for, what does he say in the Bible? He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is revealed, that is going to be revealed inside of us. He says, man, do whatever you want to me. I have an answer for every situation. Like, think about it. If you were the Roman guard, right, trying to threaten him and says, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to let you live. Or if you say, I'm going to torture you. Like, think about it. If he just looked at you and said, go right ahead. I'm joyful no matter what. Like, I would go nuts. Right? What's wrong with this guy, man? That's probably what they were thinking. It's not, what, it's not what's wrong with the guy. It's what's right with him. And what's, what was right with him was that he was a man that was filled with joy. Paul is this man who has more joy in a dark dungeon than a Christian has walking in the sunshine. That's crazy how much of joy he has in the, in the middle of pain. Why, Paul? Why do you have so much of joy? Because I'm winning whatever I do. It doesn't matter. Persecute me. Kill me. L let me live. It doesn't matter. It's a win-win situation. Even if I live or die is what he's saying. To live is Christ. That's what he starts off with. He says, man, if you're going to let me live, man, I'm going to do it for Christ. What does that mean? To live is Christ. What does that phrase mean? To live is Christ. Literally translated, it means life is Christ. Right? That's what Paul is trying to say. Do you know what he tries to mean? He says life is Christ. I, I'm sure you've probably heard phrases like ball is life. Like the guys that are listening to me that love basketball know what I'm talking about when I say ball is life. Some people say football is life, right? Some, for some other people, video games are life. For some other people, food is life. You're a foodie. You love food, right? Paul says, man, Christ is life. That's what he says. What does that mean? Like, like what does that even entail? 
right? My, like, like if you look at, if, if I ask it, and there's anybody that says, ball is life, what does that even mean? It means my time is committed to basketball. It means, uh, man, that is what has my interest. That is what has my time. Haven't you met those people? All they talk about is basketball. They know every stat there is to know. They know trivia just at the back of their mind. Like, they, they know everything. They're up to date with everything that happens. They're the walking, talking encyclopedia. They are sports center. They're everything put in one package, right? They know everything that's going on. And if you ask them, sports is life. For other people, it's video games. Man, their, their whole interest is video games. Video games day after day. Video games is life for them. Right? For some of the people, it's movies. Movies are life. You ask them any stat about any movie. Uh, you know, I had a friend like that at one point in time. You ask him uh, which, uh, you know, in the year 1959 or 1989, which movie won the best screenplay, uh, you know, in the Oscars. He'll tell you which it was. He just knew every one of them. He was a film buff. For him, movies are life. Paul is saying Jesus is life. He's saying Christ is life. He is, he is, he's saying this is what's engulfed my life. I was something else before, but right now, Jesus is my everything. My entire time is occupied by Christ. Like all he can think about, you know, he's, he's like, there's ev everything that I need to know about this Jesus and everything I need to know about the Savior and what it means to have a deep relationship with the Savior. He says, man, I let you know. And he says, if you let me live, I will spend every minute and moment of the day talking about this Jesus. That's what he means, means when he says to live is Christ, right? And then he says, man, uh, but, but death is gain. He says, why is it gain? Because he says, I get to see Jesus. Nothing more than that. I can't explain that more than that. He says, death is gain. I'm just gaining something if you let me, let, let me, let me die. You think I'm losing my life, but I'm not. That's when we go to verse number 22. Verse number 22 says this, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. He says, man, uh, if I have to live, that means I'm going to just be fruitful. I've been fruitful all this while. I continue to be fruitful in prison. I don't know anything else but fruitful. He says, I will continue to be fruitful. So beware if you let me live. That's, this is exactly what's going to happen. Church in Philippi, I'm going to come back to you if, you, if, if I live right? But he continues and says this. He says, yet which I shall choose. He says, I can choose. Uh, but I, can, I cannot tell. You, you think I, I, this, I have this in my hands. He says, but I cannot tell. It's not up to me. That word tell is important over here because that word tell is from the, from the Greek word norizo, norizo, which means to reveal, right? And it's basically, he's basically saying, man, it's not revealed to me. It's not, been, it's not been told to me. I have no revelation of this. God has not t told this to me. And because I don't know about it, and because God has not revealed it to me, I can't reveal it to you. And I don't know what my future holds. My future is a revelation. It's in God's hands. Each one of you need to know that. What's going to happen tomorrow is in the hands of God. No matter what you choose, no matter how safe you are, no matter how quarantined you are, no matter how many masks you wear, no matter how many gloves you wear, no matter how much sanitizer you use, no matter how clean you are, it doesn't matter. Your tomorrow is in the hands of Jesus, right? In verse 23, he continues to say this. He says, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. He says, man, it, you, you know what I want? He says, it's not my choice, but here's the deal. If you throw me a choice and say, what if you can choose? What if? He throws a what if situation. He says, what if I can choose? He says, man, it's a, it's a difficult decision. He says, my desire, my deep down desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. He's like, I'm not going to lie to you. I know you guys are helping me financially. I know you're giving me money so that I can pay for stuff around this prison and, and my commissary and all of that stuff. But it's nothing against you guys. I love you guys. And I, and I want to see you guys again. But man, if, if I was to choose, my desire is to depart. He's, he's found in the situation. It's like being in between a rock and a hard place, right? This caught up in this canyon of emotion. Right in between this, there's this huge, he's engulfed in this canyon and he says between, between what I want and what God wants, right? Remember that sometimes as, as Christians and as believers. Uh, what you want and what you desire is not always the will of God. And sometimes we get caught up in that. 
uh, we need to understand that. Sometimes we connect God's desire to our comfort. And that's what Paul is saying. You guys want to know what God's will is or do you want to know what I'm comfortable with? Sometimes we are okay with being comfortable rather than pursuing God's will. Right? And Paul is basically teaching us that. And he's saying, man, if you would give me a choice, one is comfort and one is not. More comfortable thing is that, man, just kill me so I can go be with my Jesus. Oh, how is that not the will of God? Right? And we'll talk about that later. But he's like, I don't know. That's comfort for me. But the will of God always does not equate comfort. Right? Your comfort is not always God's will. Ask yourself, if this, is, is, is this God's will or is this my comfort? It's so important when you pray. Are you asking God to fulfill your desire or are you asking God to fulfill His plan in your life? He has a desire. That's what he's saying. He said, I want. That's the word he uses, I want. But then he uses the word depart. He says, uh, I want to depart. And that word depart is in the, in the Greek is the word uh, analuo, analuo, uh, which literally means to break up, to unloose or to undo. Right? These three words. Uh, this particular word, uh, I want to teach that real quick to you uh, before I move on. It, it, it was a word that was used by sailors and soldiers and farmers uh, in the Bible, especially if you, if you uh, look at different instances in the Bible and also in, in uh, just the Greek language and uh, the language that was used back in the day. It was uh, used to um, convey uh, the action that these three groups of people did. It, it was connected to sailors, soldiers, and farmers. Uh, sailors because, um, you know, sailors uh, sail from one port to the other, and when they do, when they, when, they get, when they get ready to depart, so to speak, they pull the rope off the moorings and they pull away from the docks and that word is called anuluo, right? That, that particular word that to, to pull away, to, to break away from port, right? That, that's what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy, in his letter to Timothy, in the pastoral um, epistles. Like he, he talks about that in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, where he says, for the time of my departure is at hand. He says, Timothy, it's time for me to pull up, uh, pull up the anchor. It's time for me to, you know, uh, to say goodbye. My time at this port is done. My time at this desk, like this particular area, my, this field that I'm in, this mission field, this temporary place that I just visited is done. And he says, it's time to pull up that anchor and it's time to sail to another destination. That's the word he's using. You know, in our Christian circles, we have this idea of gathering together on that distant shore. Right? The, the song, I'll fly away. Right? We know that. A one glad morning. We know that song. Right? So it was used by sailors. That idea of, man, my, my job is done in this particular destination. I'm leaving. It also used by soldiers. Uh, you know, when they were camping, they would go from one place to the other and they would set up camp. And once they were done with that particular place, and when the battle was done, they would tear down their camp. They would tear it down. And they would move on. Anuluo. They would tear it down and they would move on. And, and what that just tells us is that, man, our earthly journey is like a tent like, that we, we, we put up. Our earthly bodies are tents that we pull up. And, and, and we camp out. I don't know how many of you like camping out, but it's not one of my favorite things. I remember going camping once uh, back, I think it was in 2011. One of my friends, in, when, I, when I was in graduate school, he looked at me and said, hey, you know what, our family's going camping. I know you don't have any family in town, and I think it was a Memorial Day weekend or one of those weekends where I wasn't doing anything, and they were like, hey, do you want to come join us? And I was like, sure, camping. I've always heard about camping. Let's go camping. I was so excited. I was, I was like, man, this is going to be so much fun. And when they told me about it, I was like, man, yeah, of course, I would love to do that. Right? And, and um, they didn't tell me about everything that was, that was going to happen. They didn't tell me where we were going to sleep. I was like, camping? Yeah, let's go. And then I saw them pulling out tents, and I was like, okay, this looks scary. This, this really looks scary, right? And we, we put up these tents, um, you know, and, and, and you know, airbags, and uh, we were out in, the, out in the middle of nowhere, literally. And to make things worse, my friend leans over to me, and he, he, he tries to crack a joke, and he looks at me and says, hey, man, uh, do you know there are bears around here? And I was like, 
really? Like, is that something that you should have told me? Like, you felt like that was something that I really needed to know at this moment? And, and, and to make things worse, he, he went on to say, he was like, let me ask you a question. Um, what do bears call campers in a sleeping bag, right? And I'm in a sleeping bag. I don't even, I don't even have a, um, an air mattress. I'm, I'm in a sleeping bag. And he looks at me and says, do you know what bears call campers in a sleeping bag? And I'm like, no. And he looks at me and he says, a soft taco. And I'm like, no, you know, I'm, I'm so scared. And, and that's when fun and I'm excited and I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, camping, let's go. It turned into a very scary experience. I, I remember I did not sleep that night, right? Bears didn't come anywhere near us, right? We were in a tent, bears didn't come. But man, I remember even crickets chirping, like that would scare me, right? It was just so bad. And, and forget about it, everything starts smelling like fire, uh, you know, uh, the next day and uh, after a couple of days, we were there for like two days, you start smelling ripe after a couple of days, right? And you really wanna go back home, right? I don't know if you've ever been there, but uh, yeah, camping, that was, um, you know, and, and that was enough for me. Right, I, I, I never went camping after that. Uh, and, 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 and our bodies are like tents, man. Our bodies are like those tents. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, Paul actually talks about this. And he says, when this earthly tent is taken down, we have a home in heaven. That's what Paul says, right? He compares us to a tent. That's what, that's what um, Paul is trying to say, analuo, right? The problem is, man, when we're, when we're in this camp, campground called the earth, uh, man, we, we treasure, we're so preoccupied with these tents that we have, uh, big or small, it doesn't matter. We're, we're wondering how big, if we have a small one, we want a bigger tent. Uh, we want a more colorful tent. When our neighbor buys a bigger tent, we're like, oh, let's get a bigger tent. Uh, we're always wanting to keep up with the Joneses. It could be our own bodies. We're obsessed with our bodies, like even till the point of death. Like, I don't know how many of y'all have done that, but I've, I've heard people like go up to, you know, like when they view a, a body, like at a funeral, they'll go up and they'll be like, oh man, doesn't he look good? And I'm like, uh, what? Like, he's dead. Like, like he, he looked good a month ago. Like, I don't know about right now, right? right? I mean, uh, Paul says, man, there's gonna be a departure. He says, all of us have to go through that departure. And, and it's like that, like, like taking that tent and folding it away and putting it away like those soldiers do. Right? For a lot of us, we gotta understand that. Uh, there's one day that that departure is coming, right? Uh, farmers, um, uh, farmers use the word analuo, right? Uh, the yoke that is on the animal to steer it, right? The, the yoke that they put on it. Uh, when the yoke was taken off at the end of the day, the farmer would take the yoke off. One, the farmer would, would say, I'm gonna analuo, I'm gonna take the yoke off. I'm gonna make the burden light, right? The job is done. Um, it's like a pat on the back to the animal, to the ox, and saying, hey, your job is done. Thank you for your hard work today. The yoke is now off. Now is the time to rest. It's more of that, that word that God is gonna give you saying, "Good, well done, good and faithful servant, right? And, and, and basically Paul is saying that, man. He's saying, man, my desire is to depart because I know it's gonna happen. And I know that when I depart, that yoke is gonna be light. When I depart, my tent, man, I don't have to keep, keep up with the Joneses anymore. I don't have to keep up this, but I don't have to deal with a thorn in my flesh. I don't have to deal with the sicknesses and, and all of this and this imprisonment and the beatings and all of this. I don't have to deal with this anymore. Analuo, I'm gonna be taken away. I'm gonna depart to be with Christ. And he says, that is far better. Who wouldn't want that? But then he says, man, it's not the departure that makes the experience sweet. He says it's the arrival that makes the departure sweet, right? Because that's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.8. To be absent in the body is to be, be present in the Lord. He says the absentism is not the exciting part. The present nature of being in the presence of God, being in the, the majestic presence, that is what is exciting and that's what gets me going. So if you're asking me for my choice, I want to be with Jesus because this world is way too much for me, right? How is that sweet? Uh, because some of you are like, man, how is, how is dying sweet? How is uh, going to heaven sweet? Like, is there, can I watch football in heaven? Like, <laughs> I like I, and my question to a lot of us is, do you really want football in heaven? Like, do you really want the Cowboys to disappoint you in heaven? Like, is, is, is that what we really want? Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan, but do we really want that? 
with some other people. You're like, uh, will there be cats and dogs in heaven? And I'm like, man, do you really want to go pick up dogs poop in heaven? Like, <laughs> no, like heaven will be all about Jesus. It's not, it's not about stuff. It's not. I want to be in heaven, which is so much far better, is, is what Paul is trying to say to the church in Philippi. He's like, man, if you ask me, that is far superior, far better. That's what I want. And then he concludes with this. He says, but verse 24, he says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He says, man, but my mission on earth is not done. He says, if you would ask me, that's what I want. But to be here is much more important to me because of each one of you. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. He says, I'm willing to stay for you. He says, I'm willing to go through this pain. You know why? Because of the joy that is set before me. The joy of knowing that each one of you will have a personal relationship with the joy that is in the knowledge that as soon as I get out of prison, that somebody else will hear the gospel, that I will be able to train another Timothy, that I will be able to train another. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This is powerful when we, th when we start thinking about it. In verse 26, he says this, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. You know what he's trying to say? He's like, man, because I choose to be, because I want to be here, because God's will is for me to be here, I want to be fruitful in everything I do. And he urges them to do the same thing. He says, go in unity. Be fruitful in your time on earth. Because in verse, verse 22, he, continues, he, he actually says that as, as, uh, you know, as a foundation to what he's saying right now. If you go back to verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor. He says, there is no other choice for me but to be fruitful. That's Paul's motivation. He says, you know what? My choice is that I be in heaven, but I know that for a time like this, I have to be here. But I know as a Christian, no matter how much pain I'm going through, no matter, no matter how much of unrest I'm going through, God has called me to be fruitful in a time like this. Are you being fruitful during this time in your life? When you have no reason to be happy, do you reach deep down and choose joy because God is calling you to be fruitful? Because if you're alive, if you're kicking, if you have breath in your nostrils, you are a Christian that is out on a mission. This is your mission field. And what is your mission? To be fruitful, right? What does it mean to be fruitful, right? In the Bible, there are different interpretations of that word fruitful. Uh, the, the first thing is winning souls, like Paul is talking about in Romans 1.13. Paul talks about it and says, I do not want to be, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. He says, man, my, my fruitfulness is directly connected to me reaching for souls. He's like, man, if these guys are going to spare my life, they better know that I'm going to come out there and I'm going to keep preaching because that's what God has called me to be, to be fruitful. Are you being fruitful today? is if you're alive, you better be fruitful. And, and part of being fruitful is to win other people to Christ Jesus, is to pray for your unsaved friends, is to pray for people that don't know Jesus Christ personally. That's your mission. That is what God is asking you to do today. You know what fruitful also means? It means to be holy. In Romans 6 and verse 22, the Bible says this, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Like he talks about sanctification, he talks about the process of becoming holy and being holy and carrying yourself out to be holy. It's important to understand that. The third point is giving. You be fruitful when you give to the Lord, your time, your, your finances, right? In Romans 15 and verse 26, 
He talks about receiving fruits of finances. Paul talks about that. He continually talks about how the church was fruitful when they supported him in the mission field, right? We're fruitful when we give to the people that we give to. The mission field that we sow into, the missionaries that we support as a church, we are being fruitful as a church. You being fruitful, when, you're, when your generosity outshines you being stingy, man, you being fruitful as a Christian. You were never called to be a Christian who kept everything to yourself. You were called to be a Christian who gave generously. Find an opportunity this week to give to somebody, right? I was talking about this the other day. Christ didn't say, if you have a lot, give some to somebody. Jesus looked, at some, Jesus looked at you and me and said, man, uh, take your shirt off your back and give it to somebody. If you have two, take one and give to somebody. In this season of need, in this season, let us as a church, let us as a community be prepared to give. You know something we did this week? We, we reached out to four churches all across the United States. Right? Uh, th there were churches in urban, uh, in urban, uh, sorry, not, not in urban, in rural America. There were a few churches that couldn't afford rent because they were not meeting in person and there were no offerings and tithes in person and they were not set up for online giving. And we came alongside them and said, hey, we don't want you to suffer and not pay a mortgage and not pay a rent and be ostracized for that. We'll come alongside you. And we helped four churches out financially. During this time of crisis, we were the hands and feet of Jesus to these other churches. A time like this is a time that God tests you and me. How generous are you to your neighbors? It could be with a roll of toilet paper. It could be with anything. It could be just being generous, y'all. How generous are you today? Or are you more of, oh, me, me, my kingdom, my family, my children? Or are you willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus? And saying, man, I'm willing to take my shoes off and give it to you. I'm willing to take my jacket, my coat off and give it to the uh, the, to somebody that needs it, right? And then uh, point four is good works. You be fruitful when you, act, when you live your life, your Christian life, doing good works. And it's connected to giving, but in Colossians chapter one and verse 10, the Bible says this, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He connects being, being, being you know, worthy of the Lord to, and he continues in saying, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. He says, do good work. It's important for us to understand that. It's at moments like this that God is asking you, man, where is your heart of good work, right? I, I, I want to urge you, church. I want to urge you to look at that very seriously as a Christian, right? Um, you and I are called to be Christians that are fruitful. There is no choice. You don't have an option. You are called to be fruitful. Fruitfulness only ends the day that you die. That's, that's when fruitfulness ends. Right? It's, in, it's impossible for you to be a Christian and be unfruitful. It's not. It's, it's impossible. That's my urge. That's my cry to each one of you is that you and I are on our way to heaven, right? Uh, and, and we'll be there one day. And while you're here, make it worthwhile. Have that attitude of Paul. You will have so much joy in your life, right? In the middle of pain, in the middle of your prison experience, in the middle of sickness and disease, you will know that, man, if you have Jesus, living is Christ. Win. Dying is gain. Win. Because you get to see, it doesn't matter. There's somebody that's hearing me today. It could be live. It could be a restream. It could be somewhere or the other. If you're listening to me and you're afraid of your life, if you're afraid of death, don't be. If you have Jesus in your life, what comes with Jesus is joy, not happiness. I'm not guaranteeing you happiness. What I'm, what I'm guaranteeing you and what I'm, I'm assuring you of is this deep-seated joy that surpasses happiness that you can reach deep down into even when the odds are stacked up against you and say, man, the joy of the Lord is my strength when everything else is failing around me. Because for some of us, we stop being fruitful when we go through pain. And God's like, man, I don't want you to do that. I want you to be fruitful till your last living breath. How do, I, how, do, how do I know, God, that this is not my time? How do I know, God? Because you're still alive. 
because you're still breathing. And that's what Paul is saying. Man, if, if God wanted me gone, I, I would have been gone by now. But he says, that's what I want. But what does God want? God wants me to keep going. If you have breath in your nostrils, your time is not done. Your mission field is still ripe. Your job is, is not yet done. And God's like, man, keep going, keep chugging along. To what end? To this end, when you, you know, uh, when, you're, when you were born, right? Remember when you were born, uh, you cry and the rest of the world rejoices, right? That's what usually happens. Uh, and this is, this is my encouragement to you. To what end? Live your life so well, so fruitfully, so beautifully, in such a wonderful way that when you die, you got to make sure or, 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 or it will be guaranteed that everyone else around you is crying and you are the only one rejoicing. I, I want you to take that up as a challenge, right? Rejoice because the Lord will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's why you will be rejoicing. Everybody else will be crying because the world lost a fruitful person. The world lost a fruitful person till today. I think about that day uh, back when I was growing up. We had a beautiful tree in our backyard, a beautiful mango tree uh, that would bear uh, beautiful fruit in the summer. We would go and we would eat off that mango tree. And it, was, it was crazy that one day, and we, for years, it was this huge, big tree. And one day, lightning struck, tore that tree in half. That was the last summer that we had fruit from that tree. It broke us so much. We were so sad. We were so uh, upset. It brought us great sorrow because that tree that was in our backyard that we enjoyed, that we ate from, that we climbed on as kids, that we swang from as kids was no longer. And when, when they came to chop that off, when those branches were taken away, when, the, when that tree trunk was taken away, man, there was so much of a void that filled that place. But you know what? That loss is something that you and I have to look at and say, you know what? To die is only gain. Because I know in my life that I'm looking forward to that day that I can be with Jesus one more time. You know? And, and this is where I want to look at each one of you. Do you have that relationship with Jesus today where you can confidently say that, man, if I live, great, I'm, I'm glad. But if I die, I'm glad, I'm excited. I can't wait to see Jesus. I'm okay, I, I'm okay. I know that my, my, my wife would do okay. I know my kids will be fine. It'll be all good. Do you know that one day I'm gonna preach my last sermon? Do you know that one day uh, you are gonna listen to your last sermon? It's gonna come, there's, there's gonna be one day. All of us are gonna come to that day. But you know the difference between somebody that knows Jesus and somebody that does not know Jesus is joy. The one that knows Jesus, there is this joy that they can reach down to in the most bleakest of situations, in the most grim of situations. You know that you can hold on to the cross of Jesus Christ. Man, and, and I wanna urge you, if there's somebody that's listening to me that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus and you don't know if you're okay with that. Some of y'all are probably fearful. Some of y'all are probably scared of death. I urge you today, if you give Jesus a chance and if you have a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing to be afraid about. You will embrace death. You will embrace the fears that you have. And if you're to live, you're to live, right? Uh, and, and a lot of people are probably looking at me and saying, Brother Asher, aren't you supposed to give me an encouraging word during this time of pain, during this time of uh, anxiety? Are you supposed to be talking about this right now? Yes, I have to. I have to prepare you that no matter what happens, you and I, have a glorious tomorrow that you and I can look to. And you know why we have that glorious tomorrow? Because of Jesus Christ. Man, if you don't have that relationship, I wanna, I wanna welcome you into a relationship with Jesus. I, want you to, I wanna welcome you into the relationship that I have with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a life-changing relationship. If that's you today, if you're listening to me, it doesn't matter if you're a member of commission, if you're listening from somewhere, it doesn't matter. Right now, I want to urge you, I want to remind you that Jesus is close to you, close by your side, 
He's not going to leave you. He's never going to abandon you. If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, would you accept Jesus today in your life? And if that's you, if you're listening to this message and saying, man, I don't know, I, I, I don't think I've had a personal relationship with Jesus, and, and I want to, I want this joy. I want to know where I'm going tomorrow. And let me tell you, if you know Jesus, you know where you're going tomorrow. You're going to heaven where he's preparing a place for you. And if you're making that decision today, would you close your eyes? I want everybody to close your eyes right now. If you're making the decision today, would you repeat after me? Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. But today, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe that Jesus rose up from the dead and he is coming back for me. I put my trust in him and I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Brother, sister, if you, said, if you pray that prayer with me, I want to welcome you into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. You're like, that's it. I'm like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. When you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and King, man, there's something that happens in your life that is indescribable. If you want to know more about this Jesus, send us a message. Uh, send us a private message. Uh, chat in the chat box. Let us know. We would love to get you more information. Uh, we would love to pray for you. We would love to pray for your family. Uh, we would love to, love to disciple you. And, and encourage you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Welcome to the family of God.